guys. It's still it's still it's still still yeah. and, and it's like and it's like my slide. You guys can see now what I was talking about how they moved the shit to the round. So so it's kind of postmodern, man. Everything is there, but it's just not. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's all good, man. Yeah. It's kind of good. I appreciate it. Y'all yeah. 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 making me feel good right yeah. now. All right. So this idea. So let me hear your thoughts about this idea about. Um, the Harlem Renaissance and this idea about the beauty that was created. What do you got? What are your thoughts? I heard all these conversations. Uh, one of the things that we talked about was the idea of creating a space that um, mm -hmm. didn't have an outside opinion, mm -hmm. and so uh, folks that participated in the Harlem Renaissance were able to express themselves without having to potentially water it down or cater it to a, to a white audience. Um, and that's something that we even carry over today with you know faculty and staff on campuses where we have to create spaces that aren't just about giving us coffee and donuts for four hours for us to talk about how much it sucks, but actually creating spaces where we can create action plans to uh, increase the amount of faculty staff that look like us and, and actually be able to serve our students. Appreciate that. Thank you. I saw a quote, and I'm, I saw a hand, I saw a quote that says, see how much we can accomplish if you just leave us alone? I'll send that to you guys if you all are interested. I'll, so, so that's good, being able to be in an authentic space, right? Where you're, you're able to really talk about some real things and not feel threatened, not feel like someone is looking over you, not feel like you have to look over your shoulder, and, and really making some serious power moves that you want to make that's honest with, within those institutions, right? Who, I, I saw your hand first and I'll come back to you. Yes. Well, I think for me, when I teach a black, uh, uh, I want to teach a Harlem Renaissance, one of the things I focus on is the work of George Steiner. Okay. And one of the things that Scholar does, I think, is actually show that, and, and kind of uh, shows us that uh, our humanity. Right. That we can be human, and, that, and being human means that we're not a monolithic group. Yeah. Right. And people are, and, and if, if, as you know, this novel is very critical of uh, Du Bois and all those folks, right? Mm -hmm. And so the whole idea was, was to show that because, uh, because they're not a monolithic group, they're going to be differences. And if there's going to be any unity, those differences have to be worked on just assume that DNA is going to take care of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that's something, um, uh, who was it, uh, uh, I always forget his name, um, the, the lawyer, um, he was Clinton's good friend, you guys know the lawyer. Jordan. No. Jordan. He like, said he loved that idea about us not being a monolithic group, mm -hmm. right? He's like, you know, it's, it's really great when you have differences because you can hash out things, you can learn from each other when you have differences, right? We all have this assumption that all black people think the same. We have the assumption that we're all in the same, the same social, political, economic situation. Mm -hmm. But it's all about us working it out as a collective, right? I saw another hand, and I want to move on and take one more. Yeah. Um, we were talking about, uh, among other things, that uh, this is also the first time we see an authentic urban black voice, which is still with us. Mm. Yes. And secondarily, we're thinking about uh, the addition of Marcus and Messiah Garvey. OK, yes. Yes. Mm. And, 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 and I cannot, can I, some people say piggyback, but I'm gonna say veggie back is from a vegetarian, right? Uh, <laughs> and see, get away from the pork. No, and that's good because actually I have a whole another presentation where you take Marcus Garvey, you take the Nation of Islam, and you see that pretty much everything in the Nation of Islam is based on the Marcus Garvey's teaching, mm -hmm. just an extension of modification of such. Mm -hmm. And so when you listen to Malcolm X speeches, go back to Marcus Garvey's speeches and you hear the same exact stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. People don't make those connections, right? But even the idea about black women being beautiful come out of Garveyite thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole idea about the nursing, like in the Nation of Islam, come out of the Garveyite teaching. So a lot of these things that Garvey brought to the table, if you trace it back, you can see their iterations of the Nation of Islam and, and, and a part of the, the, the black uh, nationalistic movement, starting with Marcus Garvey. And even though he never made it to Africa, but he was preaching Africa. Right? So we'll, we'll talk about that, and that's a good one. We, we, I love to get into that. All right, so the black art movement, right? So now we, we moved out of um, the, the Harlem Renaissance and now we're into the black art movement. And what we have here says the black uh, art movement continuing a legacy. Uh, the black art movement was the name given to a group of politically motivated black poets, artists, dramatists, musicians, and writers who emerged in the wake of the black power movement. Very critical. Poets, artists, dramatists, musicians, and writers still further in that extension of the Harlem Renaissance, right, but from a different mindset again, right? Um, the poet uh, Amir Baraka is widely considered to be the uh, father of the black art movement, which began in 1965 and ended in 1975, but those are just rough estimates in terms of the dates, right, speculative in terms of dates. So 
we move forward. Um, what did he say? The artist's role is to raise the consciousness of the people, to make them understand life, the world, and themselves more completely. That's how I see it. Otherwise, I don't know why you do it. So artists to elevate us, right? You know, we, we use art as an extension of ourselves, right? We use art to make our people better. We use art to raise the level of consciousness that we may have not thought about, right? Whether that's in the form of a painting or a mural, right? Whether that's song again, whether that's dance, we're using our body as a movement, right? Now we have to praise dance in church, right? We see all these extensions, all of these things are happening as another form of expression. And it's also artistic, right? But the art, again, it goes back, we need to raise the consciousness of the people. That goes back to your comment, young brother, you said being woke, mm -hmm. all right? Staying woke. And I know you guys can't see this, but I was trying to, like I said, sneak it all in as much as I can. Um, culturally relevant poems for the people. Black Pride. Wendelin Brooks, one of my favorite pieces. Um, we real cool. And right, and even if you even if you hear how she's saying it, even the intonation of how she wrote it, she says here, can I read it for you guys? It's okay. Yes. It says, uh, the pool players, seven at the golden shovel. We real cool. We left school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin, we jack June, we die soon. Mm -hmm. And she talks about how that poem came to be, right? Walking, thinking these kids are just not doing whatever, and then she stepped back. Let me just look at this from a different angle. She come up with that piece, right? All right, and then we have Amir Baraka's piece, uh, Preface to a 20 Volume Suicide Note. Mm -hmm. I think this is very important, one of his first major pieces. And he says, uh, lately I've been accustomed to the new uh, way the ground opened up and envelops me each time I go out to walk the dog. Or the um, bored edged uh, silly music the wind makes when I run for a bus. Things have come to that, and now each night I count the stars, and each night I get the same number. And when they will not come to be counted, I count the holes they leave. Nobody sings anymore. And the last night, I tiptoed up to my daughter's room and heard her talking to someone. And when I opened the door, there was no one there, only she on her knees peeking into, and I don't know what happened to the rest of this, died off somewhere. <laughs> but you guys get the point, right? And then we have Nikki Giovanni, you know, basically just being people, just being black. Right? So that's that whole idea, just basically just being who we are and being unapologetically African people. Right? Um, and I love just the devil time how everything's shifted on my thing here. But again, we had a couple of different texts here that was laid out. And in the text, we had texts from Amir Baraka, Gwendolyn Brooks, Sonia Sanchez, Nikki Giovanni, Jane Cortez, Quincy True, and Hakeem Abuchi. Mm -hmm. And so those are just some of the voices and some of the highlighted voices from the, uh, the Black Heart Movement. All right, so I think I have about 12 minutes I want to stay within the 12 minutes, so what I want to do is um, keep it moving just a little bit to get through the PowerPoint, and then maybe we can have a little Q&A. So let me just kind of see if I can get through this. Um, circling back to this idea about should uh, education be used as a tool for protest? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the state obvious, right? I was going to phrase it in a different way, but I said, let me just state the freaking obvious, right? <laughs> All right, and so this circling back to the very first part of the, uh, the PowerPoint crusade, we talked about Baldwin when you guys saw those few slides, mm -hmm. and we talked about, he's talking about this paradox of education being woke. And he says, the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. Y'all saw that, that example that he was giving, right? Um, the purpose of education finally is to create in a person the ability to look at the world for himself, to make his own decisions, to say to himself, 
uh, this is black or this is white, to decide for himself whether there is a God in heaven or not, to ask questions of the universe and then learn to live in those questions is the way he achieves his own identity. But no society is really anxious to have that kind of person around. What society <laughs> really ideally want is a citizenry which will simply obey the rules of society. Mm -hmm. If a society succeeds in this, <clears throat> that society is about to perish. The obligation of anyone who thinks of himself as responsible is to examine society and to try to change it and to fight it. No matter what the risk, this is the only hope society has. This is the only way society changes. 